back to Creator U Live. Today, we're going to talk about how to price your products and when is it time to sell bigger products. So on yesterday's call, we talked a lot about what is the right length for a product. And we use a lot of our governing dynamics, right? Is that we want to make sure we're doing the minimum viable product that we can. We want to be able to put it on the plate. We're going to talk a little bit more about the kind of dynamics of portion size in restaurants because there's a lot of great thinking there. But mainly, we, we, we focused on who are we selling it to and who does it help, right? So if we're selling something to somebody that's brand new, totally cold audience, there's going to be one way of selling things, a one length, excuse me, of products to make. If we're selling to a warmer audience that maybe is on our list, if we're selling to buyers, all of those are going to create different dynamics. So we want to take all that into consideration. Now, when we think about pricing our products, okay, how much to charge and the length of it are really tied together. Because if you think uh, a really common occurrence, and I've talked many times about my first product was 18 DVDs. And so a common occurrence is that we kind of outkick our coverage. So that's a football reference. You can look it up. And so what that means is that we just kind of paint ourselves into a corner. So a lot of times we'll make products with the best intentions, wanting to teach everything we know, wanting to help people, right? Really want to help people get results. We've kind of walked the mountain range. We've been through the peaks and the valleys and we know everything. We want to teach all that. So it comes from a great place. But what often happens is we make a product now that we just can't sell. It's so big. We can't sell it for a low dollar amount. And some of that's tied in, we talked yesterday, tied into our personal worth, the time that we put into the product, and kind of all of those things wrapped in it that we almost can't get the value, right? Now, there's a couple things that might prevent that. But one of the things we would put, I added into the governing dynamics is you're never going to get the full value of your product. You'll never get the actual full value of the transformation that you can um, achieve for someone. You can help someone achieve. And I'll tell you this, because I've hired some of the most expensive coaches in the world over the years. I've purchased some of those expensive products. I've been in some of the most expensive masterminds that there can be. And even though they were the most expensive things I'd ever been a part of, and there's, I still got a greater return from those experiences than what I paid for them. So even the highest paid coach in the world, I, I still saw a, great, a greater return than what I paid him, right? In fact, for one of them, in one mastermind that I was in, I could say very confidently that the advice I was given in that mastermind absolutely positively changed the course of my career. And what that brought me it, 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 would, it would be in the 100 to 500, I don't even know, it's incalculable to know, to know the difference that that made in my life and in the financial difference. And one of them was just one thing that was kind of like said to me in a private side conversation by the leader of that group. So we're never going to get the full value and we're going to separate our personal value from the value of our product and service, right? So what we want to make sure is that we're not out kicking our coverage. We're not creating a product that now is hard to sell, right? Because generally, most people are looking at creating introductory products, right? Even if they're not introductory products in general, is we don't want to have to make so many sales, right? We don't want to have to make three, four, or five sales in a sales letter, right? We want to be able to make just one quick sale. We want them to be able to think, this is for me, get through the page, make the sale. Because remember, we want a sale, right? Now, the longer that our, the bigger that we, our product is, the more we put into it, the more we feel like we have to charge for it. Now we're creating a sales job. And this is what a lot of the internet gurus maybe won't tell you, is it's great idea to put all of your, everything you know into a product, create a full, complete product that you can be proud of, that showcases everything you know. But now what they don't tell you on the other side is, oh, this is going to be directly tied to your sales ability. 
They don't tell you that, that now you're going to have to, if you, let's say you've got a $300 product and I'm going to talk about a $300 product that we sold and how we sold, we, we sold, but let's say you make your first product in a $300 product. And now you're going to go out into the world and you're going to, you're going to talk to an audience that's either going to be new people, list people familiar with you or buyers, right? So let's focus here on this new where most people are, right? So now you've got this big product, let's say it's valued at $300. We're not going to get what it's really worth, but $300 is a good price for, you know, a product. Now, what is it going to take to sell a $300 course? Well, the answer is it depends. And this is where this kind of little formula comes in. Sales ability plus audience equals pricing. To a new audience, selling a three hundred dollar product to a new audience, uh, I would consider. You know, I've had the good fortune of being trained and mentored by some of the greatest sales copy um, writers that ever lived. And I got to tell you, on the front end, I don't think I would ever attempt to sell a, a course that expensive on the front end to new people, because it is such a massive sales job. Right. So if you're talking about a $300 course, that's not going to be a kind of a knee jerk reaction. We want to think about, can they order if they're sitting at a stoplight on their phone? Can they order if they're sitting on the toilet? Right. Everybody's looking on the phone. Right. Can they order that quickly? Can they see that? And can they talk about pricing that makes sense? So if there's, if think about the, the length of a sales letter, it might take for you to, to invest in a $300 product. Right. That's a pretty long sales letter. That's a pretty complicated sales job that I'm going to tell you that I, I don't, I don't know that I would even take that on. Could I do it? Yeah, probably, but there's a much easier way. And that's what we're kind of getting to in all of these lives is that there's a much easier and a much uh, in an elegant way to do it. Right. Because let's say you do write the sales letter and I can say, I, I've, I've been trained by some of the best that ever lived. I would probably consider myself an above average to good copywriter. I, I'd probably skew towards above average. N not, not anything more than that. Um, and I wouldn't, uh, I don't think I would attempt it because it, first of all, it's such a complicated job. It's going to take first to write a sales letter like that. You're going to have to go through many rounds of testing, right? To get it right. Then you're going to have to isolate elements of that letter to test it and get it right. And if you're thinking about using AI to write your uh, long form sales letter, like just, forget that idea, right? That's never going to work. So I'm talking about a pretty large investment of time that's going to go through several iterations, which is fine. We're, that's, we're never going to escape that from marketing. But one of the questions that we would always ask and would be another governing dynamic is, can this be simpler? Can I do this? Can I make this simpler? And there was, there absolutely was a way to make it simpler. Right. So when we think about that is the sale, our sales ability plus our audience will determine our pricing. Now, the one thing that I'll say here, I'm going to go a little bit out of order, but I'll make this point and I'll come back to it is anybody that tells you they know exactly what pricing you should use doesn't know a single thing about pricing and probably hasn't done anything in the realm of pricing because anybody that has would tell you that nobody knows the exact pricing that you should use. This is not science because we're putting it out to the marketplace. We're putting it out to people. People are not Newtonian. They just don't do as we, we, we would like them to do. And oftentimes people are looking for, well, I want a system for selling and pricing and all that. The same way I had a system for making the product. Just, just give me another system. Well, any system that that somewhat guarantees the reduction or the removal of failure also removes all the removes all evidence of potential success and freedom because there because when you're talking about a mark there could be frameworks which we work in a lot frameworks are great right but systems not so much because when we're making the product we control all the variables We've got our, our fingers on the keyboard. We can write the songs. We can do whatever we want, right? But when we put the music out into the world, when we make the pizza and put it out into the world, we can't control how people react to it. People are, we don't control those variables. So those variables are the things that, that we have to uh, respond and adapt to, right? So there's no system 
that you can use for marketing and pricing. And anybody that tells you that there absolutely is one. Now, I may catch myself using language like that, but really what we're talking about is frameworks. Frameworks are great, right? A, a framework of a great meal, right, is appetizer, meal, dessert, generally, right? Drinks first, right? That's, that's the framework of a great meal, right? The framework of a record, you know, a, a, a musician making a record is 10 to 12 songs, 48 to 60 minutes, something like that, right? That's, that, those are frameworks, right? What's a movie? A movie's like, you know, an hour and 45 minutes to somewhere two hours and 20 minutes, right? Some go longer, some go shorter, true, right? But generally that's a good framework, right? So frameworks are great, but, but the, in working within those frameworks creates a lot of freedom to do cool things. So when we're talking about pricing, there could be pricing that could, there could be best practices of pricing that could be between $7 and $10 for intro product, right? Maybe your intro products in a specific market where if you sold some for seven to $10, it wouldn't, it wouldn't sound that great. Right? So your, your intro product might be 21, 29 to 49, or your intro product might even be like, um, a combination of, of things, right? At different price points, you might have several different offers. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but here's the thing. What you want to make sure is that you're not selling discount sushi. Nobody wants discount sushi. There's a difference, right? So we wanna make sure that the value of our product is there, right? That it's in a consumable size. So that means all uh, the value of our product and the consumable size is all tied into the ROI of the customer. Does it deliver on the promise, create value? Does it also um, give them, does it, is it at a price that they can move through quickly, right? It also gives us the ROI. Right. So we don't want to be short of that. Right. So di there's a difference between discount sushi. No. Or a lunchtime special. There's a big, big difference. Right. There's a big difference between discount sushi and a lunchtime sushi special. Right. So when, like getting back into nobody knows. Nobody knows about products. I have we've tested, done thousands of tests internally. I've seen thousands outside of our business with businesses I've consulted with and work with. And I'll tell you this, that I've seen 19 beat 17. I've seen seven beat nine. I've seen 10 beat 17. I've seen 29 beat 19. I've seen 49 beat 19. And I've seen 19 beat 49. And the thing is this, you wanna always be testing. So anybody that knows anything about marketing or has any experience in putting products out and testing them and, and are, te are looking at the pricing will know that the, the market is going to determine what they'll pay, right? They're going to tell you the right price. I've also seen in one other side story, probably one of the, the best ones I've ever seen is there was a guy that we were working with had kind of a training product and, um, and he was selling it, I believe it was like 129, something like that. And it was going okay. It was kind of like, you know, just kind of, you know, clunking along a little bit here and there. And then he just had on a whim, raise it to 349. And when he raised it to 349, it took off. Nobody could have predicted that. But what he was doing, he was using a system that said 10 times your uh, production cost, right? So he was making these things for like 12 or 15 bucks and selling them for like 129. But that's not, but, but what the difference was is that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a Newtonian system, right? A plus B equals C, right? That's not how it works though, because what the market said at that low price, at that low price, a, tra a piece of training equipment that they were gonna use for exercise, it looked like it was a piece of junk at that price. But at a higher price, it was perceived differently, right? Now that perception could be seven to 10, right? 29 to, nine, four, 29 to 49. But what you want to make sure is that again, you're, you're, you're getting your products in a, in, a, in a format that's consumable. So they get the value and they get the result. We also want it consumable because we want to establish leadership. We're assuming a lifetime relationship. And I'm going to go over this kind of little timeline I drew out here in a little bit. But we also want to sell bigger products. So our initial product, we want to get an ROI financially in profit, but we also want to set up for the long haul. We want to set up for a longer ROI, right? 
an ROI that, that will go for a lifetime. We want to assume a lifetime relationship with our customer, okay? So always be testing. Nobody knows. Essentially, this is a game of warmer, colder. So I know this is an American game. And essentially, warmer, colder, we've talked about on previous lives where if I hide something and, and you don't know where it is, we play a game where if you take a step this way and you move away from it, you would say, oh, you're colder. And if you move towards it, you'd be warmer. And then as you get closer, warmer, warmer, hot, red hot, red hot. So that's what you're doing in marketing. I've sat in the most sophisticated offices with corporate marketing and hearing them talk about their marketing efforts and their advertising strategies. And the three or four times it's happened, I always have this little inner dialogue that says, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. And then something just takes over and I go, you guys are basically playing warmer, colder. And they go, well, it's a little bit more sophisticated than that. I'm like, no, it's more expensive. <laughs> it's an expensive game of warmer, colder, but it's a game of warmer, colder. You're making a move into the marketplace. So you put your pricing out and the market says warmer or colder. But again, always be testing. So if the market says warmer at 10, maybe test 49, test 39, test 29, test 19, test different pricing models, right? Always be testing, always be testing because we might have a winner, but um, I'm not really a fan of the book, but the book, good to great, right? You could just kind of read the first line of the book and then throw out the rest of the book. A good is the enemy of great, right? We don't want to make sure that we have a good business that could be great because we're not doing enough testing. Okay, so that's pricing your product. Now, how do we now use this to move into selling bigger products? So I love this. When I want you to think about your front end products as the single, you're a musician, this is the single you're releasing. You're getting people in the door. Everything else, your album, your concerts, your t-shirts, fan club, all that stuff, that's all what we would call post success products. So we're selling those in a post-success environment. So remember, we talked about yesterday, confidence is the memory of success. So this initial product, the length of it, the price of it, the, the, the consumability of it, should be enough to produce a success for what we promise, for the problem that we can solve and exactly who we solve it for. Go back to yesterday's call, increasing the clarity and the promise of our offer. Right? So now if we, they consume that product, which is why it's important to, for it to be consumable, right? Why it's important to be consumable because we want to be selling our bigger products in a post success environment, right? So if you go out on a second date with someone, the invitation for the second date is accepted based on the memory of the first date. If someone buys another product from you, they're buying that based on the memory of their success with the first one. When that happens, it's again, it's not scientific because these are people. So we, there's a lot of variables. We create confidence. Confidence can be created in one product. Confidence can be created in, in multiple steps, right? We'll talk about in a second. But when we're selling in a post-success environment, this is an easy sell. It's a super easy sell. Let me give you these two examples. We talked about this one yesterday. If you were going to have a celebration or a birthday and you were going to invite like 10 or 15 people out, family and friends, you know, be a pretty expensive dinner, there's probably two, three restaurants you would trust with something like that. Now, when you think about that, say, hey, you know, we're going to, we're going to go celebrate this anniversary. You would say, well, where should we go? We should go to this place or that place or, oh, I love that place. That place is great. Okay, let's book it there. Now you're going to book this $1,500, $2,000 dinner make a reservation for all these people. The restaurant didn't even make a sales pitch to you. They didn't make a, they didn't write a sales letter. They didn't do a, a, a call with you. No, what they did is they were, they were selling in a post success environment. Why would you make the decision to book that big re that restaurant for your big celebration? You're basing it on the memory of success. What where did I go? Comes memory of success. They did that one meal at a time. So now they're seen as the answer. That's what we want. If you're going to, if you're dating someone, you're going to go on a weekend trip with them. You know, you, you want you, that they're going to go based on the memories of all the dates, based on the confidence that they have from all of your interactions. Now, conversely, sometimes we think about selling a big front end product on the, like you know, a, um, a big product on the front end. That sounds great. 
but it's almost like asking someone, you know, like that you just met, would you like to go away for the, uh, for a weekend with me? And that's weird. But what's weirder is like the people are like, yes, I would. Like, do, <laughs> are you sure you want to go away on a weekend with someone who just met you? Right? It's weird. And that's why we get stuck here is that we're asking people on the front end when our product is too big, we're either not selling because our sales ability, even if our sales ability is okay and we can get it done, it's like someone going away who just met you saying, I'll go for a weekend with you. Well, then who are they going to go away with next weekend who they meet with? And they're going to bounce from guru to guru to guru, right? So we want to have this easy sell in this post-success environment. So think about this. We had a, a college recruiting program for athletes. And we had basically four small intro offers that we would run between seven and $10, right? Each one of those was designed to fix a problem that somebody's having. Where are they stopped in the recruiting process? Some, some people were, start, were stopped at the start. Rob Gilbert had that great quote that it's the start that stops most people. I love that, right? Some people get stopped on the next step. Some people get stopped on the next step, the next step. We designed these products, and we'll talk about this in future lives. We design those products to get right into the place. Where are you stopped? Where are you stuck? So imagine that one of our, one of our, our, our most popular ones was a communications course on how uh, players could communicate with college coaches that they were athletes could communicate with college coaches. And it's generally for people that were not getting any bites. They weren't getting any feedback. They weren't getting any responses. They had reached out to people. So it was almost like this big wall was up in front of them. And as long as the wall was up, oh, I don't have a marker, but as long as the wall was up, everything that I had in my $300 course was almost useless to them because they couldn't get even in the conversation. So now all the stuff that I know is useless until this wall comes down. Now, these products were designed, these small intro products, short, they were consumable, they were very specific to the problem they solved and who it could help, right? We were creating a success. When the wall came down, I had, I had created a success for them, right? I was, now they had confidence in me. So now in selling our $300 course in a post-success environment, we, this course didn't even have a sales letter. That was being sold in emails to buyers right direct to a checkout link with a description of everything that was in there. There was just text description of everything that was in the course. But why was it easier for me to, why would I sell a $300 course with no real sales, no big sales mechanism, no big sales process? Because I had already created a success for them in the consumable product. I'm selling in a post-success environment. I already, I just brought down the biggest wall that was in front of them. Well, what other, what else can I help them with? What else can I do for them? This is now an easy sell, just like the restaurant. They, you, you, you sold, whoops, what happened here? Oops, sorry about that. My screen went blank. But you didn't, the, the restaurant didn't sell you on the birthday party. Now, they may do some marketing that says they have birthday parties available, but you made the sale yourself internally based on the memory of success. We were emailing that we had this course available. And they were selling themselves based on the memory of success. Now, we also had coaching and higher ticket programs. None of those had sales letters. These were sold on calls, usually from people who had one of these or, or had bought the $300 course. So you want to think about how do you sell bigger products? The answer to that is not how do you sell bigger products. Is how much confidence do you create? How much success do you create? All that equals to tr trust. And how much are you selling in a post-success environment or are you trying to convince them, right? We talked about yesterday, if they have to take the risk of time, if they have to take a risk of money, if they have to take the risk of delay of success because our product is too big or it's too expensive, we're actually cutting our own legs out from under us. When there's such an easier way is to get a consumable product that delivers on a result, increase the clarity of your offer, increase who that, the problem you solve and who it solves it for. Make it in a no-brainer price, a no-brainer price that they can move through fast, right? Create a success for them and then sell in a post-success environment. Let's take a look here at this kind of little timeline I've got here. 
right? So if you think about this, and this goes back to assuming a lifelong relationship with your clients, right? So if I'm assuming a lifelong relationship with these customers that are in recruiting, and it's really not lifetime because they're only in it for a few years, right? Maybe three years that they would be in this world of trying to get um, recruited for college. But let's assume that the lifetime relationship is three years. I've got time. I've got time. I've got time where I can build trust, right? So when you think about create a success with your intro product, your bump, and your upsell. Now, why I put this in here is because part of your pricing is also dictated by how good your funnel is. So we had order bumps on these things, and we had upsells. So sometimes we're trying to do too much on the front end where the best thing that we could do is get them through and into the buying process, get them, in, get them starting moving through the buying process. And what you might find is that your lower dollar offer on the front end brings in a lot on the bumps and the upsells. And we even tried testing, a, we tested a lot of different offers, even just to like $1, right? $1, we had like, like a dollar download kind of specials. And what we knew is that those dollar buyers that would get, we would create a success for them for $1. They'd have enough confidence in us to take up the order bumps and the upsells. We'd be able to put them into an email sequence. Well, we didn't do sequences. Let me correct that. We didn't do sequences. We actually emailed all the time, right? But put them into uh, e or, or emailing them so that they know that we have got other offers. And so when you think about this, this entirety of this, right, that we create a success, we now they're on our list after they bought our product, we've, are, we've made some money here, we build trust, we become the answer, we may have other products, they may buy these other intro offers, or they may buy a big product or coaching. Now, when you think about the totality of this, that might affect your pricing. So if you knew that your back end was so stellar, you knew that, hey, for every 100 buyers, we get 10 people who take our big you know, $5,000 thing. So we know every 100 buyers is, work, is worth $50,000 in back end revenue. Well, you might want to think about adjusting your pricing to bring more people in. Now, there's, it's all testing. So you might find, let's say we, let's say we, our price is 29 and we know that there's, there's a hundred people will end up being worth 50, you know, 50,000 and over, over the course of time, there'll be, you know, greater metrics, but just for math and conversation sake, right? You may find it, oh, maybe my intro product's 29. Let's test it at seven. You may get 300, 400 buyers come in when you used to get a hundred, but now you find only two out of those other hundred turn into 5,000. Now, this, again, this is all testing and all math. That might be good enough. That might be okay, right? But it might be that you lowered the price too much, it brought in a different type of buyer, and the, the math of your funnel didn't work out. So you might think about, okay, maybe we keep the price higher, right? So that our metrics, you know, but it's all testing. You're always playing hot, warmer and colder with everything in the market. But when you're thinking about pricing, you can't think of pricing without thinking of the bigger picture. Am I pricing my product in a way that will get people into my universe, a consumable product that give, delivers a result so that I can build confidence when I'm selling in a post-success environment, it's easier to sell my higher, higher dollar things, right? Then we're thinking about the long-term relationship of the funnel. Some of this takes time just to establish, right? It takes time to figure out those numbers and you can't just rush through it, right? You have to be able to see over time what that customer might be worth because we may have a customer come in here with one of these offers three years later, take a, uh, a, you know, a high dollar thing or a year later, take a high dollar thing. We need to see what those numbers are over time. So some of this takes time, but all of it takes testing, right? So the one thing I want to communicate in all of this is I think one of the real um, stopping points for people in internet marketing is they're so fragmented in their thinking, right? I made this product. Now let me go market it. Um, well, now I, now I made this product, I ought to market, now let me, let me figure out how to make ads, or let me figure out what I'm going to put in the ad, or let me figure out, I, I made this product, it's, I need, now I need order bumps. I want you to think about the entire thing, right? The heart and the lungs and the brain and the eyes and the hands, like all work together, right? One not more important than the other. It's all one system. 
that when you have all those parts functioning perfectly, everything goes perfectly well. So that brings us right on the nose, 1130. How about that? All right, everybody. So have yourselves a great weekend. We'll be back on Tuesday. We'll have a really special guest, a guy named uh, Chris Gorman, who is uh, an author, wrote an incredible book called One of a Kind. We're going to talk about that. If you're a creator, that book is almost about you. Um, and he was the drummer in the uh, Grammy Award winning band Belly, or still is the drummer in the Grammy Award winning uh, band Belly. So he'll be here on uh, Tuesday. That's going to be an incredible interview. And then we'll also be back Wednesday and Thursday next week with uh, continuing on this journey of building out our business. So have yourselves a great weekend. I'll see you guys all back here at 11 o'clock Eastern time on Tuesday. See ya.